Today, I'm going to be talking about tethered cord. This is an often unrecognized complication that we see in the Ehlers-Danlos syndromes and hypermobility spectrum disorders. And I'm going to discuss what symptoms might suggest a diagnosis of tethered cord and how it can be evaluated. Hi, I'm Dr. Clara Francomano, and I'm a medical geneticist who's been caring for people with the Ehlers-Danlos syndromes for many, many years. So people who have tethered cord often present with urinary symptoms. These urinary symptoms are urgency, urinary frequency. They may have difficulty starting the urinary stream, and there may also be some leaking of the urine. This is one of the hallmark symptoms that should suggest possibility of a tethered cord. Often we also hear about people complaining of low back pain and a sensation that the legs just feel heavy. It feels like they're walking through molasses or it's just difficult. The, the legs feel very heavy. And this symptom of leg heaviness and the low back pain may be worse when people are walking up a hill or walking upstairs. Another thing that people often describe to me is that they really have a preference for sitting with their feet up on the chair. So they won't sit with their legs on the floor when they're sitting on a chair. They prefer to sit with their knees up to their chest and the feet on the chair. And often they'll sleep in a fetal position, so on their side with their knees curled up to their chest. Children who have a tethered cord are often toe walkers, and the parents describe that they just don't put their heels down when they're learning to walk. So this constellation of urinary symptoms, low back pain, the leg heaviness, and a preference for sitting with the feet up on the chair, this should all suggest looking into the possibility of a tethered cord. Now, what is a tethered cord exactly? So the spinal cord, kind of it's a little bit like a rope. It comes down to a point, which is called the conus, and that conus sits at the level of L1, L2 in the usual situation. There's a band of connective tissue that's called the phylum that wraps around the nerves that hang below the conus, and that area of the cord that hangs below the conus is called the cauda equina, which is a Latin for horse's tail, because that's what it looks like. It just looks like a ponytail or a horse's tail, the nerves kind of hanging loose underneath the conus. So the phylum, this band of connective tissue, wraps around the cauda equina, and it kind of pulls down on the cord. And that takes the conus, which is usually sitting at L1, L2, and brings it down to usually the level of about L3, L4. And we can see that in children who have a tethered cord, that the conus is low-lying, or it's lower than we expect it to be when we look at an MRI of the lumbar spine. But what happens as children grow and the phylum kind of stretches out and the conus can kind of find its way back up to the more normal position near L1 and L2. And so in adults with a tethered cord, that phylum is still holding on to the cauda equina and compressing the nerves in the cauda equina, but the conus will be sitting in the more normal position. And so that's what the radiologists call an occult tethered cord, which means that we don't see it on the lumbar MRI. But the phylum is there, and it's compressing these nerves that go to the bowel, to the bladder, and to the legs and the pelvis. And this can create the symptoms of the urinary symptoms, the back pain. Constipation is also a very common complication, and some people may describe numbness in the pelvic area as a result of the compression compression of those nerves. So we can't see it on the MRI, and we use a 
another test that's called urodynamic testing to see whether the nerves that go to the bladder are being compressed. And in other words, what we're looking for is the presence of a neurogenic bladder on the urodynamic test. And the urodynamics are done by placing a catheter into the bladder. It's inserted through the urethra, and the bladder is then filled from the outside, and the patient is asked to tell when they start to feel that the bladder is full. So this is a way to assess the bladder capacity, the volume capacity of the bladder, and also when the bladder starts to feel like the person needs to urinate. And then the person who's having the urodynamics will be asked to urinate with the catheter in the bladder. The catheter has a pressure on it or on it, and it can tell whether the bladder is being emptied in a nice, smooth way, normal way, or if it's kind of emptying in fits and starts, kind of starting, stopping, starting, stopping. And the urologists have a way of assessing all the data that comes out of this urodynamic testing to say whether or not there is a neurogenic bladder, which would indicate that the nerves going to the bladder are being compressed. Another test that we can do to look to see if the cord is tethered is to do a lumbar MRI with the person lying on their stomach and then lying on their back, what we call a prone and supine MRI. And this enables us to tell if the cord is able to float down by gravity to the front of the spinal canal when the person is lying on their stomach or supine. Sorry, that's prone when they're lying on their stomach. So that's another way of looking to see whether the cord is tethered. Now, if it is ascertain that there is a tethered cord or if there's a neurogenic bladder and the, the cord does not float down to the front of the of the spinal canal when the person is lying on their stomach. There is a surgical procedure that can be done to cut the phylum and release the tether on the cord. And this often will alleviate many of the symptoms associated with a tethered cord. Now, unfortunately, if the cord has been tethered for a very long time, there may be damage to the nerves that cannot be reversed, but at least there will be no further damage damage done to those nerves if the cord is no longer being compressed. So this is a brief overview of tethered cord. If you're looking for more information, Bobby Jones, Chiari and Seringo Maelia Foundation, which is at bobbyjonescsf.org, has a lot of information about tethered cord. You can find some lectures there by Dr. Petra Klinga and Dr. Fraser Henderson and others who have cared for patients with tethered cord, and that's a good place to seek some additional information. Thanks for spending this time with me today, and I wish you the very best on your journey.